this is quite an honor for me, and um, I'm still debating whether I have to tell a priest at my next confession that I gave a sermon <laughs> in a Methodist church, but uh, we'll, 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 we'll see what he has to say about that. I was born to Irish Catholic parents, Charles James and Mary Margaret Mary Deneen McLaughlin in Little Falls, New York. Older brother, younger sister. Went to church, Lent, confessions, communion, catechism, you get it, belonging to the only church. True church, I mean, not the only, the only true church. You get it. You get your card punched, you go to heaven, no problems. But wait, I still have to live life. Catholic advice. If you are bad, too bad. We all have to suffer. May get to heaven quicker without going to purgatory. Prep school, service, college, marriage, two children, great job, four bedroom house in a golf course community, help start a new Catholic church. Good so far. <laughs> now comes the suffering. <laughs> marriage disintegrates. Divorce, disillusion, brokenhearted, sad. Help for my brother. My brother who passed away three years ago of Agent Orange, two tours of Vietnam, lived, lived and worked for the State Department, lived in Korea, Malilla, Manila, um, China, Vietnam, was a great study studier of Buddhism. He introduced Buddhism into my heart. I'll give you a lap, little background on Buddhism. Buddha was a prince born 600 years before Christ in a small kingdom in the shadows of the Himalayas. His father, the king, set up a paradise in the palace. He did not want anything unpleasant to come to the prince. One day, he saw a sick person, an old person, and a corpse. This changed his life forever. He left the kingdom, went off on his own, and meditated and prayed for many years, trying to find a solution to life's problems. After years of prayer for life, he became enlightened. He became the enlightened one, or the Buddha, this is how it's done. We cannot change our misfortunes, health, anything that helps, that, has, that help, hurts us physically. What we can do is we can control our minds and not let these things bother us. How is this done? This is done by meditation. By meditating, we're able to separate our minds from our body. And we can be peaceful in our minds, even though our body's suffering. He lived for about 83 years. And during that time, he had many, many people that came to him. One of the great stories is this woman came to him and said, Buddha, I think my life is coming to an end. I lost my child. And he says, that's terrible. But I want you to go to the nearest town. I want you to knock on every single door and ask that family, ask that mother if she's ever lost a child. Three days later, she came back with tears in her eyes and said, I'm not alone. He said, no, everybody suffers. She became a nun for him. Back to my story. Medi Lane, fun had no marriage plans, <laughs> got a 30-day cancellation notice. For those that don't know what that means, Elaine was in the insurance business, and if you don't pay your premium, premium within 30 days, your insurance is canceled and, and the deal's off. <laughs> <laughs> Went to the 28th day before I paid my premium. <laughs> we were married a week later. <laughs> 
That was exciting. I'm here someplace. See, I thought I had this all written out in order. I guess I didn't. <laughs> Elaine joined me going to the Catholic Church. We had a wonderful time. She had a head start on most people there because she had already dated a Catholic before and gone through instructions. She didn't tell me this little after. So she and I went to church all the time. We joined different groups. We helped the homeless. We helped uh, soup kitchens. Uh, she was always available if something had to be cooked while mass was going on because she didn't have to go to mass because she was a Methodist. You know how it all works. They took advantage of her, which was <laughs> wonderful. So then we went and I uh, went through the rest of my working life and retired. And we came to Maine. Actually, we visited about some place in the Caribbean and three or four other places, but I've been coming to Maine for years. And Elaine said, well, why don't we try this? So we tried that. And we decided this time that she was going to go to the monastery with me and I was going to go to her church if she could find one. Well, I'm the one that found the church, the church on the Cape for her. And we kept, we went to the monastery. We kept going here for two weeks. After two weeks, uh, she joined the choir. And she informed me that she's not going to go to the Catholic Church anymore. She's got to <laughs> practice for the choir. So I said, uh, well, that's OK with me. I really didn't have a vote. <laughs> but she said it was OK. Then I met a wonderful gentleman. I went through instructions here uh, to learn about what the Methodist religion is and also what the Church on the Cape is. And Sherwood Treadwell and I found out we had many things in common, but three main things. One was the love of poetry, one was St. Francis of Assisi, and the third was good looking wives. <laughs> I can't tell you what St. Francis has meant to my life. I always try to picture myself going back and putting myself into that period of time. Not everybody knows that St. Francis was born to a fairly wealthy father, was a playboy, was good looking, you know, had everything going for himself, and told his father that he wanted, he was unhappy. So his father said, that'd be fine, become a lawyer. This is for you, John. Become a lawyer. And he said, no, I don't want to become a lawyer. What I want to do is I want to give up all my possessions. I want to go someplace and pray, become a priest, and help other people. And his father said, good luck. <laughs> you know, and you, and you expect other people to follow you and do this? Well, he did. And we have the Franciscans we have today. A short story on Franciscans. Uh, there was a Franciscan priest during the life of uh, St. Francis, and he was walking along, and three robbers came. And he said, we want all your possessions. So he gave them all. And he had this big smile on his face, but tears are coming down. And these robbers said, what is the matter? He says, I don't have anything else to give you. But you're smiling. Well, I'm happy because I can give it to you. Everything I have, I give to the Lord, I give to you. And the three robbers says, come on now. <laughs> you can't be happy. We took everything. He says, no, I am happy. Why? Because I have Christ in my heart. I'm helping other people. And the robber says, how do you do this? That it's easy. You just have to be good. He says, we only know how to be bad. He says, Listen, God took care of that a long time ago. You don't have to be good. All you have to do is follow these 10 rules, thy shall not, thy shall not, thy shall not, and if you don't do anything bad, you'll be good. I said, no, hold on a second. We only know how to do everything bad. I said, we said, don't do it. And we may be happy, and the answer is yes. The robbers dropped everything, went back to the monastery, and became monks. Then 
I got more interested in the Methodist Church and Ruth's favorite, John Wesley. Here's another individual that had life going for him, was perfect. His father was a cleric. He went to the best schools. He went to Oxford. Actually, his brother's the one that started this little church group in the church in, at Oxford. And they call it the Holy Club, I think, if that's what it was. And, and the other students made fun of him. He said, you guys are so methodical. And they said, you, you know, yeah, you're like Methodist or something. And now you, well, you have to remember that John and Charles Wesley were always Anglicans. It was not their intent to set up another church or another religion. That was not their intent. Their intent was that we wanted to preach to those people who could not get into Westminster Chapel and churches and the grand churches. I and mean, it's like a footman, you know, or, uh, driving the carriage up, parks the horse and says, oh, I'm gonna go to church with you guys. They said, no, 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 no. We'll pray for you, but you can't go to church. And they thought this was wrong. So what did they do? They said, well, if they're not in church, it's like Sherwood said when they didn't have a, a Sunday school here, and the people said, well, there's no kids in Cape Orpus. He says, what's that school bus doing every day? And they had a children's time. So this is what the Wesleys did. They went out, and they sat on hills, on cliffs, any place to preach. Somewhat successful. I would say. In a few years, they had schools, orphanages, soup kitchens, again, and they did all these things. <laughs> 75 million people later, he ordained, I think, 492 people. Most of them did not go through Yale Divinity. They were lay preachers. His mother was upset about this, as how can you you know, make someone a, a minister. They don't speak Greek. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dick, I'm sorry. And they, and they said, listen, we're not gonna preach in Greece. We're just gonna preach here. Nobody understands Greek, you know, and now in my church, they cut out Latin. You know, that, that, we had a hold on that for a while, but now they cut out the Latin. Now, now we all have to speak in English, which is, you know. So this is what they did, and they had these lay preachers, came to America, got on horses with no money, went to town to town to preach the word. At the same time, when John and all the rest, I mean, is doing this, his brother Charles was writing poetry. I didn't say hymns, I said poetry. If you pick up the red hymnal and you look at the hymns that are by John Wesley, many of them you'll see words written 1762, music 1840. <laughs> so when you pick up the hymn though someday, don't read it as a hymn, read it as poetry, because that's what it was originally. That's what he meant. And poetry is like paintings, it's like music. It expresses something that cannot be expressed. It's a feeling that cannot be expressed. It's a hope that not, cannot be expressed. So this is what the Wesleys did. And thankful that these individuals came among us because the number of people that have been changed by the Methodist religion is huge. I have to remember that he died in about 1790. By 1830, Wesleyan College, Middletown, Ohio, started. This guy was fast. I mean, 40 years ago. I mean, that's like someone dying, you know, in, you know, 1960. And by the year 2000, they got a college started. How many times have you driven around this at Methodist, Methodist Hospital? I mean, amazing. Okay, back to my story. In this church, 
in my Catholic church, Mary to Elaine, hearing this music has just meant everything to me. But now I gotta go back and tell you what it's like to be 13 years old, Catholic, catechism. I was not very good at memorizing sermons and pieces of the Bible. I always had to put it in my own mind of what was going on. I hope I don't offend anybody. <laughs> but you know, those apostles were not that bright, you know? <laughs> And they really didn't have any courage. You know, I mean, you would suspect that, you know, you're living with this guy. He's curing people of leprosy, sightlessness, ailments, crippled, <coughs> brought, his, brought his buddy back from the dead, that they would get it. <laughs> but he died, and they run into some little room and say, what are we going to do? You know, so Jesus goes up to heaven says to God, I don't think they got it. <laughs> and God says, Jesus, go back for a few days. <laughs> he says, but I'm dead. He says, no, humans die. You're not dead. Then my brain goes back and says, you know, I wonder, you know, if he, Jesus is thinking, you know, I should have gone back with the apes and train the apes. Obviously, this was right after seeing Plan of the Apes, where the apes are more human than human and that whole thing, but that's, you know, your brain kind of goes that way. <laughs> Elaine is looking at me like, well, where is he going now? So anyway, that's okay. Hang on. So he goes back to Earth, and he appears in front of a different number of people. He actually goes back to the apostles, and they say, oh, this is great except your buddy, the twin, wasn't there that day. And he says, I don't believe you guys. If I can put my hand on his side, I may believe you then. He said, so he does, and Jesus thinks it's okay. And he goes back to heaven. He says, you know, I still have my doubts. He said, well, we'll send the other one of us. And Jesus said, this Trinity thing, there's really three of us, but there's only, he said, yeah. He said, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Oh, you, you, you mean the wind, the flame, the fire, that guy that has all these nicknames? Yeah, we'll send him back. And he's going to cure everything. So God sent us the Holy Spirit. Now, in my mind, I've always tried to figure out, you know, what is the Holy Spirit? And I've kind of come up with a lot of different thoughts. Maybe Vince Lombardi with his toughness that says, let his, made his players do things they weren't capable of doing. You know, uh, Norman Vincent Peale, they could talk you into anything. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is. Only thing I know about the Holy Spirit is what he's done for my life. He has let me do things that I didn't think I was capable of. He let me give a kidney to a friend of mine. He let me visit prison for seven years. He let me help a person get off of alcohol. And now he's letting me help a single mother. What better testimony there is than letting the Holy Spirit direct your life? And that's the end. But it's not the end. It never ends. Thank you.